if you zoom out enough and look at it as like a 50, 100 year process, it's likely that there'll be more GDP and more jobs. But when you zoom in, the last revolutions and technology changes in the five to 10 year horizon, a lot of people tend to lose their jobs. And the question today is, can we actually avoid that by being thoughtful around where that's happening and giving people a chance? Hello and welcome to the Imagine AI Live podcast. I'm your host, Chris Madden, and today we have with us Sultan Murad Saidov. He is the co-founder and president of Beamery, the leading talent lifecycle management platform. Prior to Beamery, Sultan worked at Goldman Sachs. He studied politics, philosophy, and economics at the University of Oxford, and he's a frequent speaker on AI, the future of work, and talent transformation. So we are so excited to have you here today. How are you doing, Sultan? I am fantastic. Thanks for having me, Chris. So I want to just get a little bit of background. Like, can you talk about your childhood and what you wanted to be when you grew up? <laughs> All the way back in time. I actually was uh, born in Russia. I'm from a small region called Dagestan. And uh, I moved to the UK when I was uh, about seven years old and actually ended up when I was probably 11 or 12, building my first websites, coding games and uh, starting my first business, which is building homemade computers. And I think I had this uh, desire to uh, do entrepreneurial things from that point on. I uh, started a business doing food, food and drink delivery when I was uh, 18. And one thing I realized as I was actually starting my own career, as, as you mentioned, I worked uh, at Goldman Sachs, is that the choices that you have for where you work and what you do are very different. If you're in a place like the UK or in a lot of the Western world, uh, you sort of win the passport lottery and you can do just about anything. And, uh, and that's actually the realization that led me to, uh, to going from working in finance to starting Beamery. But that sort of desire to do something entrepreneurial turned into a desire to help create more equal access to work as a whole. Let's turn to Beamery now. So it was last valued at a billion dollars. And I'm wondering, when did Beamery start and how has it transformed in this age of AI? So we started in 2013. I actually, before starting Beamery, had been experimenting with ideas of how to help change the way people get found for work while I was actually working in finance. And it was going back to that time period, it was the tail end of the last Great Recession. So lots of people who worked in industries like that had lost their jobs. And the experiment involved, at the time, a slightly different type of AI to uh, what we think of now with generative AI and chat. There was an attempt at modeling data and building some machine learning to figure out what work really meant. How can you look at, you know, job titles look the same. You can have a production manager at Netflix and in construction, and they mean radically different things, but it looks like the same job title. And what we realized is if you actually look at the transitions that people make from which school to which job, to from which job to which other job, you can start finding similarities between jobs and understanding the skills that it takes to do work. And so the early form of Beamery was building AI that understood skills and potential and what forms of work um, that potential applied to, and then built that into a sort of a people-centric CRM engine to help match people to work. Today, AI is, uh, there's a lot of different models. We look at, you know, which roles are at risk if a company's hiring, um, how to recommend career opportunities to people, and there's different models and LLMs that are applied in those use cases. But as you know, AI has come a long way and <laughs> the use cases have evolved a lot. Speaking of those use cases of Beamery, and like, so what does it look like from a customer's perspective if they want to what they want to come and try to find a job through Beamery? So our customers are uh, large enterprises, so the Fortune 2000, and the experience is software. So similar to how a sales team might use Salesforce as a customer to manage their customer database, we're the equivalent for candidates and employees. And the experience within our product is, you know, you may be interacting with our product when you're applying for jobs, but not without us because we're a B2B software. So behind the scenes, we're helping create fairer experiences for candidates, employees, but the customer of the company to whom we provide the technologies to better design jobs and better look at when they can redeploy people rather than open new jobs and so on. And um, so it's insights and intelligence and tools to help them understand their people and their, the work that they need to hire for. So maybe you could paint a picture of how have you used Beamery and the principles of what you've created with your software in your own company? Yeah. Well, in our own company, it's uh, similar to what our customers use us for, which is understanding what 
work really requires and which people might be best suited to it. So if you take AI, for example, when you have a new AI need, let's say something like content labeling, there is a temptation to look at somebody with direct experience in that. And every time new technologies emerge, whether it's blockchain a few years ago or AI now, most companies and us included would be by default tempted to hire for somebody with the exact experience of what you're trying to hire for. Uh, what we can do is identify who might actually have adjacent or similar skill sets that could be easily trained or given a chance to do it. So for us, for example, some of our AI projects involve people from customer support or QA because the work they do is actually very relevant and similar to the kind of work that's needed for AI tasks and projects. And a lot of that doesn't require a full-time job. You can actually create a project and have people temporarily do a gig or a rotation into that. And so we use our own technology to identify those similar skill sets and help identify where gigs could be created or people could be trained and just to better design the work and opportunities in the first place. But it also allows us to not wait for applicants for new jobs. We can rediscover people who have applied for similar jobs. And we actually have a product manager that recently joined and we were able to identify somebody who'd applied for a different role a couple of months ago and not even wait for new applications to come in and say, actually, you applied for a different job, but your skills and interests are perfect for what we mean by a product manager. And that's exactly what we, uh, we do for, for our clients too. What are the inefficiencies of talent acquisition and hiring in general? There are plenty. You know, when we started, the question we asked ourselves was, why don't companies treat people like customers? Like if you think about how frictionless our experiences as customers have become over the last 20 years, whether it's, you know, using a Netflix or an Uber, and then you think about the typical experience as a candidate or an employee trying to get a job, you just fill out hours of applications and usually don't hear back. And under the hood, that's because HR systems have optimized for tickets and process like payroll and onboarding and applications. But beneath that, there is no real intelligent people data or engine. There's not really an understanding of what could you do? So as a result, as a consumer, you can use a product like Google Maps and say, where am I? Where do I go? What's the fastest route? As an employee, there's no equivalent to say, what career could I take? Who do I speak to? And so a lot of that comes down to data and then the recommendations and experiences that you don't have as a result. And so the basics of it is how do you consumerize what it means to be an employee or a candidate in an equivalent way? And the equivalent of geolocation for careers as it is for maps would be understanding your skills, your interests, what are you capable of? And then the routes that you can take to say, hey, do this course. If you want to be in this new career path, this is what you do. And this is the kind of experiences that get you there. And so you can end up then creating very equivalent consumer-like experiences, not just for new jobs, but for helping people develop themselves within their existing jobs. So how long would it take, you know, one of these big enterprises that you work with to find the right candidate before versus how long it's taking them now? It's a very different answer depending on the type of uh, roles and hires uh, because there's high volume work where you generally hire in days and other jobs it takes months. And the general pattern to look at this is twofold. Firstly, when you start using a CRM and a consumer-like approach to hiring, you don't need to wait for people to apply for jobs after you open a job. So if you think about the typical life cycle of I've opened a job, I wait 30 days for somebody to apply and then interview for 30 days, and you have two to three months to sort of hire for a job. Some jobs take more, some less, but let's say it's roughly two or three months. You cut out the first month just by having immediate pipeline of applicants ready before you've had to open a job. So oftentimes it's roughly in half and that you can sort of cut the time. Um, but there's other cases where it's more meaningful. So right now, a lot of companies are simultaneously uh, letting people go for cost efficiencies in roles like customer support whilst hiring for new jobs. I mentioned AI content labeling, that's a good example. And actually what you can do is not only help them fill the new jobs faster within days rather than months, but you can save existing people's jobs because you can say, hey, you can redeploy these people, you can retrain them. And so a big part of what we're helping a lot of organizations do is not only do things faster, but actually keep and upgrade their existing workforce as part of that process. And so are you keeping this database of all these applicants and people like those applicants, these job seekers can be, you know, you're helping match the companies with these job seekers. And so these job seekers are kind of like could be floating around to other companies, like popping up in their feeds. So, so we're software. So while we have hundreds of millions of people going through our systems and we track over a billion people who've gone through across our customer base, we aren't 
a LinkedIn. We're not giving people a way to just reach out to people. We are software. And so the clients that we have, just like if you were using Salesforce, you don't suddenly get access to everybody else's prospects and customers. It's software. It's a way of understanding your own. Our software is equivalent. The data that we, we track is designed to help each client manage their own employees, their candidates, and their work and their jobs. Great. And the company structure, you've co-founded this with, is it your brother? Yeah, that's right. What's the story there? Can you give me the founding story of you and your brother heading off to start Beamery? Yeah, well, we didn't so much head off as we were living together at the time. <laughs> so it was uh, very localized. We, uh, you know, had a similar childhood and experience of uh, moving to the UK, having a family that ended up losing their work as a result of having to relocate. And so the, the motivation of solving the passport lottery and creating a fairer way for people to be found for work and for this kind of hiring stuff to happen uh, is something we discussed a lot as we were both growing up and then starting our own careers, he also worked in finance. And so we had lots of similar thinking and talking points. And so when we started doing the experiment of analyzing and uh, the similarities of jobs and then inferring skills from work, et cetera, that was something that we were living together and doing together. So there was a realization once we actually started the business together that living together may no longer be a good idea. Uh, so we ended up moving uh, into adjacent uh, apartments, a wall apart, which I think definitely saved us some sanity but still uh, very glad that we got to do it together in close quarters. And when you look back at this journey of Beamery and starting in 2013, what's been the hardest moment in this journey? There's been a lot of tough moments. I think the world in 2013 for starting an HR technology company was very different to trying to start that kind of company today. I remember for, and we were, you know, bootstrapping. We didn't have any easy access to funds. I actually took out a personal loan to fund things after I ran out of my own savings. And the first year when we were starting out, I was half time doing my other job. So I think the first three years of getting things off the ground were probably the, the toughest. And that being said, you know, there's the sort of new challenges that uh, the 10 years we've now been doing this take you to, to the brink of uh, questioning your uh, ability to survive and endure and so forth. But I think that beginning early phase, one of the things that we had to do is make the choice of whether we moved to the US and the West Coast. And uh, we spent about six months in the US. And at the time, one of the investors that was uh, going to be leading our round said that we would have to relocate uh, to California because there was no talent in Europe. Given the kind of business we were starting, that kind of rubbed us the wrong way. The whole point of what we were doing was creating equal access to work and showing that talent is uh, distributed equally around the world, even if opportunities aren't. And I think the, the sort of navigation of then rebuilding things and doing so while bootstrapping definitely taught us a lot of good lessons. So when did you make the decision to take VC money and go that route? So we took that decision uh, around about 2015. I think there was a, when, when we started, there was a point where we were near profitable from day one. But we were having to make some compromises in the product to do that. We essentially had to be a combination of software and a marketplace in order to be able to make revenue early on. And there was a point where we saw a path to building the business we really wanted to build that would require more funding, but also require us to, in some ways, step away from some of the revenues we were starting to make when we started, really doubling down on enterprise software. And there was a set of investors we met in Europe, actually, who came forward and gave us the, the opportunity to commit to that more ambitious vision earlier on. That's great. So you've passed your Series D in funding now. Who are your biggest VC backers? So we're lucky to have some phenomenal investors. We have investors that are global, including Index Ventures, EQT, um, Ontario Teachers. We've also had backing and support from some of our partners, uh, Microsoft, Workday, Accenture. We've definitely been blessed with a lot of really fantastic investors and partners over the 10 years of now doing this. Awesome. I think me and the, the audience now understands your company and where you're coming from. And I want to shift now into AI more and your thoughts on the future uh, in this changing landscape. I mean, ChatGPT kind of knocked everyone over the head almost two years ago now. And it's why we started a conference around generative AI and this podcast. And it's, it's really brought, you know, scratch the itch the creative and imagination of so many people. What do you think the biggest transformation that's occurred because of generative AI in this new wave? I think some of the bigger transformations haven't yet occurred because they're still in pilot form in many ways. 
but I'd put it maybe into two categories. There's the consumer category. You know, there's lots of people around the world that are now using ChatGPT for their day-to-day -day productivity in a way that is more accessible than being really good at using Google search, applying it to lots of personal use cases that maybe unlock creativity. I remember one of the things that got me into programming many years ago uh, was a book called Program or Be Programmed. And it talked about how every time there's a new information age, whether it's writing or video, most people start off as consumers of a read-only experience. You can watch films but not know how to make them. And I think ChatGPT has for a lot of people unlocked this ability to, you know, generate images, do create videos, do whatever you want. And I think we're in sort of in the early days of seeing how much that is and not just replacing traditional experts in image and art and video making with just lots of AI generated, in some cases, noise, but actually assisting it. You know, you have Oscar winning films like uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once that was Jet AI supported and how they built it and used a lot of AI models. And I think ChatGPT is unlocking similar levels of creativity and, it, you know, indie making of films and games for many people. But I think the more interesting cases are a slower burn because they are within businesses and how it's changing the way that businesses operate. And the reason I think it's too early to really see that is because most organizations take a few years to truly build in and test out their own approaches. You know, you have Microsoft launching things like Copilots, but even Microsoft's Copilot is becoming a store with lots of embedded sub copilots. And a lot of those are going to be launching in the next one to two years in a more mature form that really starts to change what software is and what digital products are. I remember when ChatGPT came out, Bill Gates used the term, it's the biggest revolution since the graphical user interface. And I think that element of looking at it as an alternative interface actually gets quite interesting when you go beyond just chat and start going into a sort of a breadcrumb experience of adjacent insights and nudges and things that make the tools you use, not just a digital assistant to something you already want to do, like search for this, get a result, use Excel, get a, get a formula, but actually start to suggest to you things you might not have thought of. You know, if you look at our world of recruiting and HR, people might ask a question on ChatGPT, like help me write a job description. But what's starting to happen is interfaces that go beyond just giving you an answer and say, but before you post this job, maybe consider this person in your team that's actually a really good fit for trying this out. This kind of adjacent data insights is often available within everyone's devices and computers and companies, but you'd never think to search for it or be sophisticated enough to look across multiple devices and systems to say, oh, maybe I should speak to a colleague about this opportunity before I post the job. The same applies to, you know, travel. You can ask ChatGPT to write your travel itinerary, but there's now products emerging that are more sophisticated to say, but before you book this trip, here's some considerations that you didn't ask about in terms of places you may want to visit or times of year or good deals or whatever it might be. And in fact, I think the idea of technologies that start to preempt you and start you know, telling you this is something you might want to think about is a very different paradigm for what we all get out of tools to what we've had before. Yeah, it's fascinating. And bringing it to Beamery, how are you using AI in Beamery to make that more process more powerful? I mean, we've been using AI from the beginning and we actually started using LLMs in 2018 when Google first open sourced them, not for chat, but for improving our ability to understand skills, potential and process large volumes of data to understand some of those things that help match people's opportunities. Where ChatGPT came in, and we actually launched the first gen AI product in HR and talent in March last year called Talent GPT which was a combination of our AI models and a wrapper with Microsoft's OpenAI. And in essence, what it would do is allow us to use very controlled, hallucination-free, audited AI models to do the actual recommendations, like, oh, this is the job or this is the requirements, but wrap it around with an experience that was conversational. So you could ask, hey, can you help me find opportunities, which would hit Microsoft and OpenAI as a question, be translated into our recommendations, and then come back with a combination of our recommendations and some open AI assisted uh, words. And so you end up creating this, this sort of hybrid process that feels like a natural conversation, but under the hood is actually using completely non-gen AI, AI models. And in reality, I think that the, the co-pilot components are interesting in large part in that ease of use way, making it easier to use natural language and search 
but you still have to be very cautious, especially in HR where people decisions are, are used around when you actually allow a certain AI model to run or how you package it. So we are very careful not to automate any decisions. You know, we would never tell somebody do this job or hire this candidate. A lot of it is around how you assist, give people choices. I mentioned Google Maps, you know, Google Maps can tell you a route, but it can say, but you can skip traffic here and here's a route if you want to cycle. In HR and talent, that is an important ethical mental model to take. How do you give people routes and choices rather than say this is the way, whether it's in helping people plan their jobs or plan their careers or decide how to prioritize who they hire. So that's really a core principle of how the sort of interface and transparency of the recommendations has to go hand in hand with the actual AI in order to make it an ethical process. That's so cool. And so just doubling down that ethical, like how do you keep the the privacy of the company's data secure and just like inboxed within that company and your software? Yeah, but both for companies and for candidates and employees. And for every company, it's their own tenant, right? We, uh, like you asked earlier about whether we share data about all candidates, we don't. So every company has their own candidates and employees and it's never shared with other companies. Mm. And really as a candidate, Everything we do is very tied to consent. Back in 2015, things like GDPR started coming out, which wasn't AI based then, but it was pretty revolutionary for industries like HR because GDPR was a human consent based regulation and systems like HR didn't really track humans, it tracked tickets, applications, et cetera. And so it paved the way actually for making it easier to now manage AI because you know, systems like ours came into place and said, well, you can have consent, you can opt out. If you are in a company system, you can say, hey, stop messaging me. And now you can actually have that consent count because of systems like ours tracking you as a person and letting you do that. I think AI is increasingly becoming a space within which consent is also important because you may choose to be an applicant for a company, but not want your data to be used for AI models. And things like that, I think, are, are going to start kicking into different experiences where you can opt in or out and at least understand what you are opting in and out of when you um, submit your data somewhere. Five years from now, 10 years from now, do we have to worry about not having enough jobs to go around? Are there going to be less jobs in the future because of AI? I think it's a super important question because the time horizons are a big factor in how we can look at that kind of question. You know, on the one hand, we don't know. On the other hand, we have comparisons of previous industrial revolutions and technology revolutions that suggest that if you zoom out enough and look at it as like a 50, 100 year process, it's likely that there'll be more GDP and more jobs. Again, likely this may be different. Um, but when you zoom in the last revolutions and technology changes in the five to 10 year horizon, a lot of people tend to lose their jobs. And the question today is, can we actually avoid that by being thoughtful around where that's happening and giving people a chance? You look at the 1800s when we had the industrial revolution with machines being applied in um, industrial towns where they had sewing and so forth. And we associate groups like Luddites that protested against that as being anti-technology, but they weren't actually anti-technology. They were anti not being given a chance to upskill they were threatened by the looms and were looking for a way to actually participate in that change. And I think we have a similar problem now, which is all of this AI stuff, you know, when you think about are lawyers going to lose their jobs because AI is writing content or people in customer support or even recruiting who are just sending emails and doing tasks that AI seems to be good at, going to lose their jobs. The answer is they might lose that work, right? That work may now be done by AI. It doesn't mean that there isn't a different type of work for the human to do and be upskilled into. But just like with the Luddites, somebody needs to help create that upskilling. There may be fewer jobs of the same type, but in order for the, for the people who do those jobs to evolve, you need transparency and you need choices. And that I think is gonna be really key to determine whether in the five to 10 year horizon, lots of people lose their jobs or people end up having a chance to upskill. If you look at the first people who were losing their work as a result of AI, in art, you know, we had two years ago, before ChatGPT really good at writing, we had image generation. And some of the earliest adopters of image generation and people who got jobs out of that were also artists and people who already had skill sets in that space. The challenge is that once something gets commoditized, 
artists may not be as easily paid the same amount. So you need to consider what are the protections? What are the copyrights? What are the things that protect work? And I think the thing that we see is that you can start doing some of that by giving people visibility. There's lots of data that says these are the skills and work that's at risk because of where AI is going, whether it's in labor work because of robotics or in word-based work like law. But there's also lots of data that says these are the kind of jobs that are evolving and emerging that you could train into. And also the jobs that are possible to evolve by adopting AI rather than being by replaced by it. If you're a lawyer or recruiter, there's lots of work evolving that actually involves using AI to get more insights in order to help you win clients or work within the business rather than just do more text-based tasks. And you can adopt technology to upskill yourselves into doing that. It might be higher value work and certainly people are hiring for it. So I think it's this question of adapt and change or be at risk, depending on how easily people are able to navigate that and how much people are supported, we may be able to avoid a lot of people losing their jobs. What are those jobs that are emerging that by learning AI and by adapting, you should be able to secure employment in the future? And you know, what can people do to learn those things? I think that it's as much a question of existing jobs changing as new jobs emerging. There is probably no job that isn't going to require different skill sets because of how AI is evolving. I mean, you take a look at healthcare and you have researchers that used to spend four or five years either doing a PhD or coming up with a new protein and then suddenly AlphaFold comes out and does protein folding for all proteins. It doesn't mean researchers can't exist. It means that they might not be researching protein folding, but it also means that they'll probably be using tools like AlphaFold to go into a different direction with what they can now unlock and research into now that that problem is mostly solved. And they'll be using different technologies and data sets. And so it's quite likely that being competent with understanding not just how to use AI systems, but how to be more tech and data literate in any job is going to be very important. And I think it's also important to be mindful of where the work that you're doing that is simple might be observed and automated away. You know, you have jobs that seemed to be very niche and not really AI specific, like in the CIA and police force, you had jobs like super recognizers, people who went out to protest and could recognize faces. And it was actually a very high paid, high skilled job. And a couple of years back, super recognizers were asked to do their job while looking at a computer and clicking around on who they recognized. And it's very easy for an AI model to learn and train just like image recognition and replace their work. I think the same applies to anyone's work, whether it's manual or, or digital. And if you look at the tasks that you do that are like that, the question is, to what degree, whilst those tasks might start being automated away, can you become a person who's more productive and scaled? If you are writing or reading documents, you can start getting assistance in summarizing them, but also taking the time back to do more strategic things, like advise your company on best practices or looking forward where the risks might be. In recruiting, it may be moving away from opening jobs and interviewing people towards looking at which jobs are at risk, or how do we interview uh, or hire faster, or how do we understand quality of hire. And these kind of more strategic topics and questions in any job or company are becoming available more easily to any worker and any person doing it. So the answer is going to be very different for different industries. But I think a bigger question is, to what degree does this free up anyone to actually be more entrepreneurial and do their own thing or work in smaller teams? I mentioned everything ev everywhere all at once. It became pretty difficult in the last decade to make top films and AAA games unless you were part of a multi-billion dollar studio. Now, it's becoming easier for a small team of people to win an Oscar and to build you know, a, a world leading game. And so, and equally, it's become much more liberal to access both the best education and capital and so forth, wherever you are in the world. So you don't have to have the privilege of being in the top city with access to everything to be able to build whatever you want to build. And I do think that's, that's democratizing the kind of work people can do and how anybody can you know, start businesses and projects in a more liberated way, thanks to how technology is making that easier. People realizing that they've got to take the initiative and learn these tools and start seeing how they can amplify their current roles and, and do more with what they're currently doing, bringing more value. And, you know, I worry about the, the people that aren't in high skilled jobs or in high education jobs 
I mean, there's going to be manual labor and service jobs that you would think wouldn't go away, wouldn't be changed with AI, but there's still going to be a lot of displacement and disruption. Do you see any societal things that we can do as a society to help the people that are going to be displaced and disrupted by this new technological wave? I think that there are waves that come together. There's an advert out right now by Tesla offering people opportunity to pretend to be a robot to train their robots and do various humanoid machine training. And I think this element of, you know, manual work isn't at risk. We can obviously see that self-driving cars, even in factories at all work is at risk in different ways. And AI isn't new and robotics isn't new. These things are just accelerating. And there was an interesting book by one of the co-founders of DeepMind, the part of Alphabet, as you know, that really kickstarted the AI revolution by the work that started off in video games. And the thing he talks about the book in the coming wave is how we tend to be bad at predicting where things are heading because we tend to overlook how much of the evolution and change comes from two parallel trends coming together and creating a different wave. And right now, a lot of the biggest risks and perhaps most interesting things are the intersection of what's happening in AI and what's happening in biotechnology or what's happening in AI and happening in robotics. Mm. And I think as we look at where the things that we need to prepare for or how things evolve are, we're never going to be perfect at predicting how those things happen. But I think we can start being more mindful of where the opportunities aren't just about the AI and the risks aren't just about the AI, but just about the, the things that are evolving and being influenced by the confluence of change. And that applies as much to manual work as to sophisticated work, in my opinion. Do you think universal basic income, UBI, has a place in the future? I am personally a huge fan of universal basic income, and I would definitely say so. I think it has to go hand in hand with a number of social change and opportunity programs. And one of the most exciting things with AI and technology is how much easier it is making to learn and train into anything. You know, we now have a world where most people have access to the world's best education and internet without having to pay for it or pay a lot for it. And if you look at some of the things happening in the education space, uh, starting with even tools like the Khan Academy and how they've created personalized AI assisted tutoring for everyone in the world, so that you don't just need to have access to the world's best tutors to have access to the world's best education. And it is allowing a lot of people in parts of the world that previously couldn't have had the top jobs or training in coding or sophisticated things to be able to now access that work. And I think the question of how we lean into that, not just in universal basic income, but really encouraging people to tap into the opportunities now available and creating more education about it. And it's very easy for all of this change to create more fear than engagement. And I think that we need to definitely consider things like UBI because it is very feasible that we're not going to need everybody to be employed or certainly in the Western world, that it's not going to be economically feasible for everybody to support themselves in the same way things evolve towards more unemployment. Um, but we also want to give people more chance to be self-employed or trained into jobs without having to go through traditional expensive education. Besides uh, the employment and workforce disruption that AI is likely to bring, what fears do you have about the future of AI? I think there's a lot of things that could go pretty badly wrong. I don't have a, a view on how close we are to a singularity or whether AGI is truly coming in the near future. But I do think that the accessibility of doing sophisticated things creates some risks that we don't necessarily know how to control. So for example, it is now possible to sequence a potentially lethal drug or a biohazard without being a sophisticated biologist or chemist, because there are AI tools that you can give instructions to and say, hey, make me a pathogen that does X, Y, Z. And we have some pretty basic controls in place for how these tools are built and tracked and monitored. And the same applies to the dangers of how AI and evolutions in technology could suddenly put all cryptography at risk, or even already there's a sort of arms race between how people are maintaining security and access to their finances or data. And we don't necessarily know how quickly we can tip over the edge and a lot of systems, both personal and corporate and national, can become compromised. We have had cases of people hacking into guns and cars and various other things. And I think the question of how in control we are of the governance of AI is, is an interesting one. There's also questions of uh, democracies. You know, AI is embedding very small biases into how we think. There's even studies that show that the use of tools like ChatGPT 
while it may look like you're just using it like search, is gradually influencing the way that we actually form opinions towards something that's more aligned to the answers from ChatGPT. And so there can be equivalence to, you know, Trojan horse style viruses that we used to have 10, 20 years ago that actually just inject slightly different biases into the tools we use and can start forming our opinions or influencing our opinions on everything from how we vote to how we think about the world. And those are also risks because that is the thing that leads to democratic outcomes. I think all of these are real risks. And there are certainly some groups that are really focusing on the governance of this and both protecting our personal freedoms and democracies and so forth. But it's such a new field and we have so little control and data to understand how this is evolving that it's um, going to require, I think, more efforts in ethics and governance for this to be something we can feel safe about. Yeah, well, you bring that up kind of reminds me of how Elon Musk brought that up about open AI and how open AI is biased and that he wanted to create the X AI to to combat that and be an unbiased version of AI. And with the upgrades that he's produced, the recent one of the image generation and how you can just generate any image that comes to your mind, you know, there's all these absurd pictures of Trump and Kamala Harris and, you know, and they look really close to being real. And with these platforms that misinformation or, you know, if information that maybe is true, but then is found out like six hours later is not true. I just wonder your thoughts on Elon Musk and what he's doing with XAI. It's really interesting in terms of freedom of speech, right? The question of whether anyone should be able to do anything. The challenge, I think, with applying the principles of freedom of speech in the AI world is it puts further risk towards the integrity of any information and also just of malicious acts, right? Whether it's you no longer being safe from anyone generating an image of you or a fake version of you that is plausible and could create risks to your own personal security. Or I think in Elon's case, you know, an integrity question of whether he actually means what he says or whether he's just trolling and just trying to play around with something that is pretty dangerous and risky. Obviously, I don't know Elon's intentions. I don't think anyone does, but I certainly think that creating ungoverned models that allow anybody to generate anything they like prior to us having tools available that let us fact check or contact check is risky. And this is kind of the big debate around how do you let these things evolve? I think one argument will be that if not Elon, then eventually somebody will do this, right? Eventually, it's likely that the box will open and we won't, won't be in control of anybody generating anything. The question is, how quickly do we let that happen? And do we have a responsibility to let the tools that are being built to help us fact check and say, this is a real picture, this isn't, to mature more? Right now, we can't tell if something is AI generated. OpenAI and others have published research attempts and have, as an anthropic that say whether it's a text or images, it's pretty hard to detect whether something is AI generated. But that will hopefully change. We'll hopefully be, build in more sophistication into how we are able to identify what's real and what's not. And if we let that happen prior to opening the box of all of these tools, I think we'd be in a safer world and people would feel slightly less anxious about not knowing what's real and what's not. So that would be my view on Elon. Certain things shouldn't be rushed for commercial gain or personal reputation. And I do feel like this is an example of uh, something that is very rushed without considering the consequences. Do you sometimes feel like the United States and its AI development is kind of like the Wild West and then everybody else is trying to keep up? Or I feel with like the EU is doing all this AI regulation now and is a little bit too little too late where all this stuff's happening in the US and they're trying to be, it's, it's his arm race. And yeah, you know, I, I don't know how to view it. I personally am quite impressed with how quickly regulation is moving on this topic compared to how it's moved on anything else, right? For especially the EU, which traditionally takes many years to move on anything, to have formed such deep regulation and frameworks in such a short time is quite impressive and gives some room for optimism for how well we can rally people around to control this. It reminds me a little bit of how during the pandemic, nobody thought the entire world could go into a coordinated shutdown. But where, where there's a will, there's a way and people manage to, do, to coordinate certain things. And so I do think that the US has similar pockets, but perhaps less of a, you know, coordinated government push so far, but there are still things happening. Right now, a lot more responsibility is on the corporations. And I think we're lucky that some of the leaders in AI were companies like Google, who've been very cautious about a lot of things. And I think Microsoft have been pretty thoughtful about it too. There are definitely more risks as this becomes more accessible for anybody to build and do. 
but there are capital constraints that mean that not anybody can suddenly do it. So I don't think we're in the complete wild west yet, but we are certainly teetering on the ability for people to control and regulate this. The reality is that whether it's the US or Europe, people are afraid of how this is going to move into the political sphere. You know, we already have election interference and hacking. And when you throw AI into the equation of risks for national security and demographic security, there's clearly going to be a lot of things happening behind the scenes that might be less worried about what's happening on X, more worried about the degree of control and visibility that governments have into how this stuff is fooling or influencing their citizens. Yeah, and it's almost like we need a you know a citizenry 101 class or online citizenry 101 class that you know helps prepare people to this changing reality. And a hundred percent, I think that's going to become essential. You don't really want people to assume that all information is fake. <laughs> you have to have some ways of people and knowing how to use these things and control these things. I ran across a quote that I think, I think from Naval who said that one of the last industries to be changed by AI is recruiting because recruiting, it's inherently a human field where you're not going to hire somebody you've never personally met before and there's a lot of due diligence involved. Do you see that to be the case? I think that should be true. I think that you want AI to help people have better conversations with the right people rather than replace them. I think that's actually one of the ethical responsibilities for companies like ours who are building AI, but also those using it, because we actually already have cases of companies removing humans entirely from the process, including governments. Both the US and the UK have had news articles around how they had people end up in a job without ever meeting a human. And interestingly enough, that's in some ways the older generation of AI. You know, 10 years ago, we had companies like Starbucks and Amazon and others um, being either calling themselves out or calling out the risks of how extracting keywords or selecting people away from resumes um, without speaking to them can be problematic. I think today we actually have an opportunity for AI to not really tackle that side of recruitment, but do the opposite, which is help people understand which jobs to apply for and help companies design work better. And so the association of AI in recruitment equals remove the human is, I think, a misnomer of where the opportunities or the interesting things are. The association of helping people be better prepared for work and for companies to design better work is a lot more interesting and both create better outcomes for the company and, and the people. What's your advice to high school students that enter university today and on what career path to take or things to consider? It's a tricky one because I think you have to follow your own interests and skill sets rather than having some sort of generic artificial answer. But I do think that it's important to not be drawn to the immediate hype. You know, if you want to be successful in AI, it may not be that you are better off studying AI or computer science. You may be better off doing what you're already interested in you know, whether it's biology or sales or politics, because these things intersect. I think finding your own personal passions and developing skills in areas that you're interested in is often more important than figuring out how do I land in the exact experience or thing that is currently hyped. And certainly it's becoming easier to be a technologist without knowing technology because you don't need to code to code anymore and so on. And that would be my advice to figure out which spaces you're interested in, but also just your personal passions for what you think you're good at and what you're good at. And then to look at how do you expose yourself to randomness and opportunities rather than assuming that, you know, it's going to be a fixed career path and you have to have everything figured out. Yeah, definitely. And what's your advice to people that have finished university and are entering the job force and any hacks you have for people applying for jobs today? Again, hate to generalize, but I do think that there's a lot of people who are exposed whilst at university are starting their jobs. So just a lot of the bigger firms who have those sort of graduate recruiting programs and so forth. And that is, a for many people, a good place to start. But increasingly, you know, we live in a world where it's not about careers for life. Most people can be better off trying things out for shorter periods of time and figuring themselves out. So my advice would be to consider what experiences you want to learn from and really consider your own personal growth and not just consider the compensation and the salary and the brand of the firm but really chart out your own personal trajectory for what you want to get exposure to and get better at. And because you will be likely, if you then build the right network, which would be my other advice, definitely try and meet people because combination of building your own development plan and network is going to help for most people help you figure things out no matter where things go. I do think that in most cases, you're better off wherever you're applying, having somebody you know within that company that you can either reach out to directly, even if you don't know them before, or try and get in, in conversation with. 
because one, you'll get to learn more about the company and figure out if it's for you. And two, it is very often advantageous to have some connection with the teams that you are trying to apply for and join. And if you can proactively reach out beyond just applying for jobs to try and connect with people, that can often go a long way. Great advice. And with Beamery, where do you see yourself and your company in five years time? Is there a big goal that you have? Any tech advancement that you're trying to implement into your software? Yes, on both. The vision that we started with of creating equal access to work is now much more important because of how quickly the risks to work that we talked about are happening. And so it's not just about inclusion now, it's also about creating protection for people to have better transparency of what else they could do and how to train and redeploy themselves. And also choices for companies to be more thoughtful about how they train people rather than just how they hire into the change that's happening. You know, this is the most existential moment for companies across most industries. And for us, the next five years is a critical moment in time where both through the software we're building, but also that through the best practices we're trying to promote in the industry for how to build ethical AI and make ethical people decisions, how that, you know, sets the paradigm for what happens for the following 10 years. Can we help avoid unnecessary job losses? Can we help more people adjust their roles and careers faster? And if we can just be even a drop in the ocean of pushing that in the right direction, we can have a very big impact. And, and that's what we're trying to do. Amazing. Well, Sutan, this was a wonderful conversation. You're a brilliant individual. It was a very fun talking with you. Is there any final message you'd have for our audience or how they can get in touch with you? Thank you so much, Chris. It's been a really fun conversation. And uh, I am available if you uh, go on my LinkedIn and drop me a note. I uh, would love to, to chat to anybody who wants to talk. Thanks, um, thanks again for hosting. Oh, yeah.